Hello everyone. Welcome to the second of our library lunchtime lectures for this semester. I hope you all have your sandwiches and drink uh, to keep you going through this uh, exciting talk. I'm very happy to welcome uh, Professor Toral Dayar from the Department of Computer Engineering and also Associate Provost at Bilkent University as our speaker today. And his topic, Markov and his chain. This sounds kind of exciting and painful. Uh, which way we go. Um, I'll say a few brief words about Professor Dyer uh, and his background, but I should then give the uh, podium to him because you've come to hear him speak today. Um, Toro Dyer uh, studied his Bachelor's of Science degree at Metu, uh, across the road, uh, in computer engineering. He then moved to the United States and did his Master's and Doctoral degrees at uh, North Carolina State University. Uh, after that, he returned to Turkey and joined the faculty of Bill Kent. He became full uh, associate professor in 2001, full professor in 2002. He served as associate dean for engineering uh, in 2011, and this year became uh, associate provost. He has published numerous academic articles in high impact factor journals, and also recently, uh, very uncharacteristically for engineers, he published a book analyzing Markov chains using uh, Kronecker product theory and applications, published by Springer. Uh, he's received numerous awards and has a number of important academic memberships. I won't go into all the details of those, uh, but they reflect his important contribution to uh, his field. When not working and researching and administrating, he likes to attend concerts, to go biking, and to do gardening. Okay, I should be quiet there. Just to remind you all, please uh, switch your phones and other devices to silent mode, uh, and we will hopefully have uh, five or ten minutes at the end for questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me, and I also thank uh, Burju and uh, Ülkan uh, for helping with all the uh, publicity. Um, this is uh, very much my research area, uh, which I was uh, introduced when I was doing my master's in the United States. Uh, Billy Stewart uh, was the person uh, whom I took a course from. And at that time, he was writing his book. Uh, it was on the numerical solution of Markov chains. Then I ended up working with him as his PhD student uh, at NC State. And uh, that's where I uh, came to know about these. I'm, I'm still learning, so uh, I find it interesting. I hope you also find this interesting. This will be an elementary uh, level talk. And no innuendos with the chains there. Um, so I will first give uh, some background information on uh, who uh, Andrei Markov is, and then I'll uh, move to some uh, examples, the first one being uh, small and the uh, other uh, two examples larger. So Markov uh, was born in 1956, and uh, he died in St. Petersburg in uh, 19, uh, 1856, and he died in 1922. Um, he was the son of a public servant and a homemaker, so he did not come from a family of mathematicians. His doctoral advisor was uh, Chebyshev, and his thesis was on number theory. He was not a particularly good student in secondary school, uh, but uh, had an inclination towards math. So that's where he excelled later on. He spent all his life in St. Petersburg, and also uh, he was associated with the university, and once he uh, became a, a member. He was also associated with the Academy of Sciences, which is known by the name of Russian Academy of Sciences today. I took this photograph from this site, which uh, is actually a site that is kept in honor of his son, which interestingly has the same name. So uh, he's A.A. A. Markov Jr., uh, which you will see on the next page. So he was the department chair of this department, his son. Uh, for about 20 years, uh, and his expertise was in mathematical logic. His sons, his is in, uh, as you see, many, many uh, areas. Uh, theory of numbers, mathematical analysis, and probability theory. He was one of the best chess players in St. Petersburg, and he uh, played chess by correspondence. Uh, he was greatly influenced by his PhD thesis advisor, uh, in uh, his teaching perspective. So he paid attention uh, to problem solving while teaching. Uh, he thought that one would make concrete examples 
while teaching especially uh, an abstract uh, subject like math so that uh, people uh, understand how the uses of math uh, could be uh, possible uh, in, in daily life. He taught the course on probability theory after his PhD advisor left the university for uh, 20 years, even after he was retired. Um, his master thesis title, you can see there, uh, was on uh, algebraic forms, and his uh, PhD thesis was also on uh, something that you may have even encountered in high school, continuous fractions. Um, he published a book in 1890 called The Calculus of Probabilities. This book was published four times in Russian and was translated to German in the uh, early 20th century. I think it's still possible to obtain a copy of this uh, through uh, an electronic distributor. And uh, as far as I know, it, it has a selling price of about 500 euros per copy. <coughs> Chebyshev, his PhD advisor, is interesting. Uh, he was the first Russian uh, to write a dissertation on probability theory. So there was no uh, dissertations on probability theory in, in Russia before that. So that's an interesting note to make. So uh, we will come to the part where uh, he uh, coins this uh, chain uh, to solve a problem, actually. But there are obviously earlier ideas related to Markov chains. Uh, you may have seen these again uh, while in school, uh, these urn problems where you have urns, one or two urns, and they're different balls in the urns, and you pick these randomly, and then you exchange them or take one and put into the other one. The, uh, the original one is the Bernoulli Laplace one, and that is a specialized one due to Ehrenfest. And these are actually special cases of uh, Markov chains when you look at them. Brownian motion, due to the botanist Robert Brown, is, is also uh, quite related to Markov chains. Uh, it's a special kind of a random walk. A random walk is a walk that uh, you can make, uh, for instance, in one dimension. You, let's say, toss a coin, and the coin tells you whether you're going to move right or left. So it is simply a random walk, as simple as I can put it. So uh, Brownian motion is also can be categorized as a random walk that is done uh, where the steps that you take can happen at arbitrary points in time. So it's a continuous time random walk, not a discrete time random walk, where the, uh, the, the walking steps are taken at discrete points in time rather than in continuous points in time. Um, so the gambler's ruin problem is, is, is also uh, quite related to uh, Markov chains. The gambler's ruin problem is a problem where you have two gamblers who actually bet against each other with finite amount of money. And the question is, who's going to lose uh, their money first and go out of the game? This is what it uh, is about, simply. Uh, study of the stock exchange by Bachelier uh, was something uh, that also can be categorized as a uh, Markov chain. So his PhD thesis is about this. Um, so the information that I've taken in this uh, background section is from actually two papers. The first one uh, I quote here in this slide by Basharin Langul and Nomov that was about the life and work of Markov that came out in 2004 in the special issue dedicated to a Markov chain conference. The first appearance of uh, the, the concept of Markov chain is in this uh, paper by uh, Andrei Markov which is the extension of the law of large numbers to dependent quantities. The law of large numbers says what happens if you actually repeat an experiment many times, uh, and how does the sample mean, the mean of this uh, group of experiments that you have sampled as a result of these experiments, uh, compare to the actual mean of uh, the, 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 the probability distribution. Actually, that's what it's about. So. <clears throat> He was the first one uh, in this paper, which got published in Russian in this, uh, the Faculty of Physics and Mathematics Bulletin uh, of Kazan University uh, in 1906, uh, that you do not need uh, independence as a condition for this convergence result to hold. So I do not want to go into the details of this, but he had a colleague, uh, his name was Pavel Nekrasov, and Pavel Nekrasov, which he did not uh, think uh, very fondly about, so Markov did not really like this person, uh, devised Markov chains to, uh, as a counterexample, 
showing that you did not need this independence of uh, observations property for the convergence of the sequence of random numbers. And that's how it came into being. In the same years and after that, uh, there were people who uh, contributed to the same line of work, sometimes in, in different domains like uh, Perron and Frobenius, who were not working in probability, but they were working on uh, matrices. And I will uh, start talking about matrices uh, briefly. Matrices are actually two-dimensional arrays of numbers, simply put. And in this talk, we will be concentrating on only square matrices, which have as many rows as columns. And they store numbers in them. And if these matrices have only uh, positive values, you call them positive matrices. If they can have zeros and positive values, you call them non-negative matrices. So we will see that the theory of Markov chains can be cast in matrix theory. And the earlier work of Perron and Frobenius is what uh, is in line with this. <coughs> Uh, concept. And uh, von Mises is, is, is the second person uh, who has uh, worked uh, in trying to find the connection between Markov chains and matrices. Uspensky uh, had taken courses from uh, Markov in St. Petersburg and eventually he immigrated to the States and he wrote a book in 1937 and uh, bringing the uh, probability tradition in St. Petersburg to the States. Frechet is another person uh, who had a book in that area uh, in 1938, book on, uh, again, finite Markov chains. Markov chains meaning uh, we will see that have a finite number of states. Romanowski is another one uh, which also has a book uh, in about 1950s. Feller's book uh, was a classic uh, in this area, still being uh, consulted uh, for denumerable Markov chains. We'll talk about uh, that concept, meaning the, the, uh, the states in the Markov chain are uh, countable. So you can map the states in the Markov chain to the set of integers. Then there's the classic book of <coughs> Kemeny and Schnell. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Kemeny because he's also the person who uh, has found the basic programming language many years ago in the 19, uh, let's say late 1950s or 1960s. And Kemeny and Schnell from the uh, University of Dartmouth in, in the US. And they uh, wrote the first uh, book uh, on Markov chains, uh, which did not use the concept of what we call eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay? So it avoids those concepts. It's a very readable book, a classic, it's still being consulted today. And uh, this uh, group of information here uh, I've uh, taken from uh, Senata's uh, paper in the anniversary meeting uh, that took place in 2006 in North Carolina, uh, which was uh, the 150th birth year of Markov and the 100th year of his uh, devising uh, the, the, the tool of uh, Markov chains. So the first place where the word Markov chain appears is in a paper by uh, the famous mathematician Bernstein. It's in 1926. And below that, I've listed some of the areas that uh, Markov chains come up. I will uh, give examples, two examples from this area. One will be uh, from queuing theory. Uh, I will give that one uh, before uh, the one uh, for the internet applications, the page rank computation that uh, takes place uh, in the web that we use by Google today. So let's move to this. Uh, first uh, simple problem and see how uh, we can model a, a physical situation using a, a Markov chain. So the, the problem is about an absent-minded professor who has two umbrellas and she uses these umbrellas to commute between work and home. So these two umbrellas could be both at home or work or you can have one of these in either place. So we have these possibilities. If it rains and an umbrella is available in her location, which could be home or workplace, doesn't matter. So it's, you will see it's only important where she is at that point in time. If it's raining, she takes it. So if it rains, she takes the umbrella if there is one with her when she goes. If it's not raining, she doesn't take any umbrella with her, even though there's one that is available. Now suppose that it rains with probability P. Each time she changes places, independently of what has happened in the past. 
Now we will show how you can model this uh, sequence of events that take place as a, a finite Markov chain. In this case, it is a Markov chain of uh, three states. And once we do this, we will be able to answer many questions like what is the percentage of commutes, for instance, during which he gets wet once we assign a value for this p, like, uh, for instance, uh, 0 0.6. So <coughs> we need only three states, actually, to model this system. The state 0 corresponds to the situation where she doesn't have any umbrellas in her current location. Then, deterministically, that is with probability 1, she's going to go without an umbrella to the other place, which will have the two umbrellas with her in that place. Because it's, they're not here, right? They must be at this other place. So maybe she's at home in state 0. Then she's at state 2 at her workplace. Once at her workplace, if it rains, she takes one of the umbrellas and takes it with her to home. And that happens with probability p, because we said that it rains with probability p. On the other hand, if it doesn't rain, she forgets to take the umbrella, right? And uh, she uh, moves from state 2 to 0. The two umbrellas remain at her workplace here. If she has passed to state 1, which is, let's say, home, and she has one umbrella, again, now she has a chance of taking the umbrella if it rains, which happens with probability 1. And she does not take the umbrella and goes to the other workplace and remains in that state. The workplace has one umbrella, which happens with probability 1 minus p. So this is a state transition diagram, which has states, in this case, three states, 0, 1, 2, not written in that order because of the semantics of the uh, sequence of events. And then you have these probabilities as arcs. On the arcs as probabilities, you have these numbers, which, as you can see, the outgoing arcs from each state add up to 1, right? Because that's uh, how we chose to model this system. The next state, as you can see, depends only on the current state. That's where the dependency is. So it's an order one dependency. I, if I know where I am, I can tell you with a certain probability where I'm going to be in the next time step. So the dependency is only on the current state. Once I'm in the next state, then it becomes the current state. And then I can tell you where I'm going to be after that state. So I wrote down as examples possible sequences of uh, 10 steps that you can take from state 0. For instance, you can go to 2. Then from 2, it is possible to go to 0. It's possible. From 0, you cannot go to 1 directly. That's impossible because there's no arc that leads from 0 to 1. You have to go to 2 first to be able to go to 1. So this is a sequence of 10 steps. And the probability that these sequence of steps are taken, assuming that the sequence of steps are taken independently of each other, the first one happens with a probability of 1. Going from 2 to 0 happens, if you look, with a probability of 1 minus p. So we keep on multiplying, as we have in the uh, probability of independent events, these probabilities. And we end up with this 1 minus p over 4 times p to the 3 for these 10 different transitions. Now, this is not the only path or only sequence of transitions that lead from 0 to 1. We're not saying that. But this sequence of transitions with this probability leads from 0 to 1 in 10 steps. That's what we only say. And similarly, here's another one as an example, which takes me from 2 and uh, brings me to 1. So you may be interested in answering the following question now without forgetting the first question that we posed. What is the probability that after n steps, the professor ends up in state j if she starts in state i. And i and j are either one of those three states. And now we have this matrix uh, notation, p, which has, as you see, three rows and three columns. And the row indices indicate the current state, and the column indices indicate the next states. And these are the zero entries where we don't have the arcs, and the other ones are Corresponding to the probability of those events, let's go back and take a look at the, for instance, the probability of passing from 0 to 1 is 1. I don't have any other transitions that are possible from state 0, if 0 is the current state. And from 1, I can go 
either to one or to two. I cannot go to zero, and let's check, yes. I have one minus p for the entry one one, and I have p for entry one two. So this p is a stochastic matrix that represents the evolution of the system as a Markov chain. And it's a, a matrix of one step transition probabilities. It is non-negative, meaning each component is zero or positive. And being stochastic, it's row sums. If you sum up across each row, you have a sum of one. Now, it's quite interesting. This is a one step transition probability matrix, but the two step or the nth step transition probability matrix can be found by multiplying this matrix with itself. And this matrix matrix multiplication is not like the ordinary multiplication that we know. In a matrix matrix multiplication, in order to find the ijth entry of the product matrix P times P, you have to multiply the ith row if i is 1 and the jth row if j is 2. You have to multiply the ith row and the jth column like this. So the corresponding elements get multiplied and this P gets multiplied with this 0, this 1 minus P with this one, and this P gets multiplied with this 0, and you sum them up. So this is uh, the way we do a matrix matrix multiplication. So if you do the matrix matrix multiplication, P with itself, you end up with this matrix. And this matrix, which has that superscript 2 at the top, is a two-step transition probability matrix. If you look, it's again stochastic. If you sum up across the rows, you end up finding always ones. So let's take a look. From 0 to 0, it says, I have a probability of 1 minus p. From 0 to 0, 1 minus p. Well, in two steps, there's only one way I can go from 0 to 0. I have to go from 0 to 2, which happens with probability 1. And I have to go from 2 back to 0. There's no other path that leads from 0 to 0, right? So 1 multiplied one by 1 minus p is 1 minus p. And that's what I have in that entry right here, right? So it seems to check. Obviously, you can prove that it works. But just to convince you that the two-step transition probabilities are the elements of this 3 by 3 matrix that we find by multiplying the matrix. In practice, we never multiply matrices with themselves. We will see why. Maybe you can guess. The matrix up there has many zeros, and if you keep on multiplying matrix with itself, it will start becoming full. And eventually, you will see under certain conditions, you will have a matrix which has all positive entries in it. Okay? So because of that reason, we don't do it in practice, but as a, as a mathematical tool, we just want to show you that that's what happens. So the ijth element of Pn is the n-step probability transition matrix. It tells us the probability that the professor ends up after n steps in state j if he starts in state i. So the model associated with that matrix, we call it a discrete time Markov chain because the transitions take place in discrete points in time that can be aligned with the set of integers. It's a sequence of random variables. The random variables are these states here. And the dependence between the random variables are only to the previous state. The previous state determines the possibilities of the next state. So that's why we say it's an order one Markov chain. Now, although we're not going to discuss this in this talk, it's possible to extend this dependency more into the history. It's possible to do that with a change of variables. So it's easily done. The cost of doing that is the increase in the number of states that you would have. But so do not think that Markov chains are only applicable to uh, systems which have this order one dependency. No, you can go to order two, order three, order four, back into the history as dependencies. And uh, the cost of that would be the increase in the number of states. Now, the number of steps to exit the current state i is geometrically distributed because of the probabilities associated with the arcs. And the parameter that is uh, associated with the ith state is actually the probability PII. That, that's how it goes. So if PII is 0, it means in one step you leave that state. But if PII is not 0, it's PII raised 
to a certain power, let's say n, times 1 minus pii. So you keep on tossing heads n times, and in the n plus four first toss, you end up tossing the tails, for instance, right? So you have to repeat that experiment a number of times, and that's where the geometric distribution comes, because it's raising that probability to a certain power, and that probability is something that is less than 1 in practice here. Uh, so if the professor starts with initial probability distribution right now, pi 0, whose ith element is the probability of being in state i initially, what is the probability of being in state j after n steps? This is another question you can ask. So given an initial condition, can I tell where I'm going to be at a certain point in time? Uh, we will call this the transient probability distribution at step n. It's easily computed by multiplying the probability distribution of the system in the previous step with the matrix P from the left. Then you obtain the situation in the nth step. You can keep on doing this by successive substitutions, and you will see that you have to multiply the initial probability distribution, pi 0, with P raised to the nth power to get the probability distribution at the nth step. This probability distribution, it, it, it's represented as a vector, which is a special case of a matrix. You may want to think it like that. It's a row vector. So the elements are uh, written in a row, and they sum up to 1. So that's why we call it a probability vector. So I'm using this notation here. Summation across all i's of the elements of this vector pi has to be 1 for all time steps. So it's always a probability vector. P being a stochastic matrix guarantees that whatever you multiply as a probability vector from the front with that ends up being a probability vector. So, for instance, if the professor started in state 0 with probability 1, then at the end of the first step, she could be only in state 2 with probability 1, because there's a single transition in the transition diagram. But once she's in state 2, the probability that she is in state 0 after the second step becomes 1 minus p, and the probability that she is in step one, uh, state 1 becomes p. So it always sums up to 1. And then if you multiply this once more by p, you can tell where the probabilities are at the end of three steps. The question now is, as this n becomes larger, as we say, in the long run, how do the elements of this p raised to the power n behave? Or is there a condition which guarantees that we have certain values there? Again, without going into too much detail, uh, we say that if this p corresponds to what we call an ergodic discrete time Markov chain, which requires that this discrete time Markov chain possess these three properties, irreducibility, meaning you can reach each state from every other state by following the possible transitions in the diagram. So all states are reachable. A periodic meaning current state is not time to a particular time step. And positive recurrent means each state is revisited infinitely often. And the mean time between visits to the same state is finite. So it doesn't become infinite. Now, there are certain rules in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the results in the literature for instance, if the Markov chain is irreducible, and if it's finite, meaning it has a finite number of states, then you can say it's definitely positive recurrent. So I mean, there are some easy results like that in the literature. But under these three conditions, and aperiodicity is also needed, as you can see, the powers of n approach a limit, a limiting matrix, actually, which has a special vector along its rows, which is called the steady state probability vector of the discrete time Markov chain. Some of the elements of this vector add up to 1. If you multiply the matrix P on the left with this pi, then you end up obtaining the same vector, which means it's also a stationary distribution. How do you solve this? Well. Well, you can pass this pi to the left, and then you can cast this as a linear system. And then today, you can let the computer solve this linear system of equations and obtain pi in this manner. This is what people do. Um, how do you obtain the n-step 
transient probability distribution, well, you keep on multiplying the vector pi with p. And there's a, also a faster way to do this, but simply you can do it like that. So you keep on multiplying a vector with a matrix. You don't take the powers of the matrix itself. So returning back to our question, the uh, probabilities that we have in the steady state vector for this discrete time Markov chain, uh, modeling this umbrella problem is for the zero state, it is 1 minus p over 3 minus p. For pi 1 and pi 2, it turns out to be the same, which is 1 over 3 minus p. So if you add these up, you will see that it's equal to 1. So returning back to the original question that we cast, what is the percentage of commutes during which the absent-minded professor gets wet? Well, if you look into the system, she only gets wet if she's in state 0, where there are no umbrellas in the current place, and then it rains. Because if it rains in that case, she doesn't have any umbrella to take with her, therefore she's going to get wet. And what is the probability of that? event taking place, that's the probability of being in state zero in the long run times the probability that it rains. These are independent events, so you get to multiply them. So even, for instance, in a country like, let's say, England, where it rains quite regularly, let's say 60% of the time, she only ends up getting 10% of the time. So because if you substitute that in pi sub zero, you get 1 over 6. 1 over 6 times 0 0.6 is 0 0.1. So this was that first problem. Now a second problem, uh, a queuing station with unbounded waiting line. Very simple example, but there seems to be a difficulty. As you can see, there are an infinite number of states. And in this system, events take place in continuous time, meaning they can take place at any instant along the time axis, the real axis in this case. <coughs> so the green circle shows the server, and there's a, a, a waiting line behind that that is unbounded. So theoretically, you can have an infinite number of customers joining the queue. The customers join this queue with a speed with a rate of lambda, and they depart from here, from the server, uh, once they get service with a rate of mu. So they keep on joining one by one. They depart from the server one by one. So at any given point in time, there's a single customer in the server, or the complete system is empty, meaning the server is idle, and there's nobody in the waiting line. In state one, you have one person in the system. That must be in the server. The waiting line is empty. In state two, there's one in the server, one in the waiting line, and similarly. So you make a transition from state zero to one with a rate of lambda, and from 1 to 0 with the rate of mu. And the ratio of lambda and mu, if we write it as rho, can be called the load on the system. For this system to behave stably, this lambda over mu must be less than 1, right? So the rate by which customers join the system must be slower than the rate by which we serve them, right? Because if they join faster, then we will have a Q buildup, intuitively speaking. You can get that. So possible sequences of states within 10 transitions, you could be in zero when you start, an empty system with an idle server. Then you can pass to one. Then from back from one to zero, if there's no arrival, but the service takes place earlier, then you go from one to zero. Then from zero to one with an arrival. Then before the departure of the customer that is being served. If there's an arrival, you can go from one to two, from two to three in that way, then from three to two if there's a service completion, and so forth. Within 10 transitions, you could be reaching state one from state zero, so that's an example. Or you could be in state 10 with a certain uh, probability, right? Here we have transition rates. So in this case, the matrix model for this, uh, what we call the continuous time Markov chain, is a is a matrix like this, which has three diagonals along the main diagonal of the matrix. The transitions corresponding to the arrivals with the rates are written in the upper diagonal, and the, the, the super diagonal, and the ones in the uh, sub-diagonal of the matrix are corresponding to the service rates. And in the diagonal of this matrix, 
we write the negated sum of the off-diagonal entries so that the row sums are zero. In fact, um, in this particular case, we say we have what we call a birth and death process, where births correspond to the increase of indices by one, and uh, the deaths, which happen with uh, rate mu, happen uh, to take the system from state i to state i minus one. So you increase the index by one when the death happens. So that's a birth-death process. And that's a tree diagonal uh, generator matrix corresponding to a continuous time Markov chain associated with that queuing system. So the dependency is, again, only to the previous state. If I'm talking about the current state, if I'm in the current state, the dependency is between the next state and the current state. So order one dependency. Time to exit current state is negative exponentially distributed. The negative exponential distribution is that negative element, actually, that you see along the diagonal of this. It is exponentially distributed, meaning uh, it obeys a probability distribution that has a cumulative distribution function where the time to the event taking place, that being less than or equal to this t, which has a value, is equal to 1 minus e, where e is the base of the natural logarithm, times q sub i i t q i is the diagonal element of the matrix, and t is the value that we have plugged in there. So on the left, I, I, I showed some examples for that distribution where this parameter lambda, which corresponds to minus q i i in that case, is 0.5, 1, and 1.5. So it levels off as time passes, right? The event is eventually going to take place, right? So the probability uh, becomes one in the long run. So in this case, the steady state probability distribution satisfies this pi times q, where pi is the steady state vector, equals zero. If q is irreducible and positive recurrent, you do not need this a periodicity condition in this case. And then transient probability distribution is obtained by solving this uh, the, this matrix exponential equation, actually. So I do not want to discuss them further. So if we return back to our question, what is the probability of, for instance, finding an empty system? Once you find the steady state distribution under the stability condition, the probability of encountering an empty system in the long run is 1 minus rho. So that's the probability of observing an empty system in the long run. Expected number of customers in the system is the random variables, right, which indicate the occupancy in the system, multiplied by their probabilities, the steady state probabilities. It turns out to be rho over one minus rho. Expected time in the system is the expected number of customers divided by the arrival rate to the system due to a result that we have uh, from 1960s called Little's Law for open systems. And once you know the, the average time that you spend in the system, which is one over mu, minus lambda, you can find the waiting time that you observe in the queue, which is the expected time you spend in the system minus the time you spend in the server. So the web graph is a discrete time Markov chain, which has been used by the founders of Google in 1998, but they published their results much later. So they started appearing around 2003. So they visualize. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the web pages that exist in the web as a graph, and this corresponds to a, a, a web of six pages. An outgoing arc indicates that there's a link from that page to the page where the arc is leading to. So there's a link from page one to two, and from page one to three, but there's no outgoing arc from page two. So what they do is they said, well, we do not know the behavior of people, so it would be fair to assume that you get equally, uh, you know, you equally click with an equal probability. You click each one of the links that are available on the page that you're visiting. So that's why, at those places where you have arcs from one to two and one to three, they put these non-zero numbers, and they say that if I don't know anything. I'm going to assume that they're equally distributed, right? That's uniformly distributed. So 1 over 2, 1 over 2 for two arcs. The second line doesn't have any outgoing arcs. The third line has three outgoing arcs. For those places, they put 1 over 3 so that they have sums of 1. So 
Obviously, this is problematic at this point, but they said that, well, we can fix this problem. We can add to that second row a vector of all 1 over 6s, because once I reach that dead end, then if I don't know anything, I can assume that I can start from one of those other pages, also including 2, with equal probability, if I don't know anything, right? So the first fix to the web graph that they did in the form of a discrete time Markov chain is that they put a positive row which adds up to one uh, for those rows which have all zeros. So this is that fix here. The second fix that they did is, well, when I'm surfing the web at a given page, uh, I can behave according to this discrete time Markov chain that I formed, but also Randomly, I can jump out of that and start surfing one of the other web pages, right? So they introduced the weight. Here we show it with beta. So with probability of beta, you surf the web page by following the link structure. And once in a while, which has probability 1 minus beta, you jump away. They call this teleportation. So you jump out of the web page and enter one of those other pages in the web with equal probabilities. So this u times v, remember the v is a vector which has all 1 over 6's for this example. So this is a matrix u times v which has all 1 over 6's, 36 of those inside itself, 6 times 6, so 36, 1 over 6's. So interestingly, this is a, a, a solution by construction they also ended up choosing 0.85 for beta. And you may wonder why. This is a fudge factor. So if you make this larger, you will be using the behavior that is available in the link structure of the World Wide Web more. But the solution algorithm, which you need to use to find the steady state distribution of this matrix, will end up giving you the solution much later. So Therefore, you have to use something that is not very close to one, but far away from one. But if you get too far away from one, this is possible, then it means you're giving a lot of weight right, to the second part, which is this jumping away from the current page and randomly surfing the web. So this 85 resulted in the, in the Google matrix, as they call it, to yield the solution in about 50 iterations with a known method called the power method. So they were able to compute this very fast if they used beta. So this is what they used in Google uh, and, and, and still using uh, a version of this. Once they obtain the steady state vector, they sort the components of the steady state vector. Those give the ranks of the web pages. Now, so what is the challenge today? The challenge is to specify uh, discrete event dynamic systems that are multidimensional, not uh, single dimensional like the ones I've showed, but multidimensional uh, because systems are normally composed of interacting subsystems, specify them as multidimensional Markov chains, compactly store the specification on computer, and analyze the Markov chain on computer. So all this should be automated. And uh, Systems from stochastic chemical kinetics or, for instance, multi-class, multi-server retrial queues, which are used in call centers, can be analyzed, for instance, using these level-dependent QBD processes. Remember the QBD process corresponding to the <coughs> this birth and death process? So this is not a birth death process. Here you have scalars in each element. Here you have matrices. So you can use this structure to uh, solve relatively complicated problems like this uh, without uh, much difficulty on computer today. This kind of uh, model, for instance, can be used to handle those problems. And wh what we do is uh, we uh, try to use uh, a model for the subsystems that form the system by interaction we try to model them uh, individually so that they're smaller rather than uh, trying to model the complete matrix like this, corresponding to, a, in this case, a continuous time Markov chain. And the question is, 
Can I solve the same system, that is this system, by operating on the smaller matrices that I have? Because I have advantages here. Here, if you count, I have to store 53 non-zero values. But here, I only need to store these non-zeros on the computer, these ones right here. The others are special matrices, identity matrices, which you don't need to store. You only store the, 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 a flag indicating that they're identity matrices. So you can reduce the cost associated with uh, storing very large Markov chains on computer with this approach. But the, the uh, open problem is whether you can also uh, make the solution vector, which is as long as your state space size, shorter by following a similar approach. That, that is a problem that has not been answered yet. This is where I would like to end. OK, thank you very much. I think uh, Professor Dyer chose some of his examples with me in mind, because coming from the United Kingdom, as you said, it rains a lot over there. And also, we do like the full queues. It's characteristic for British people. But, uh, that comment aside, we've got uh, maybe a couple of minutes before we finish. So if anyone has a question for the Hodger, uh, please go ahead and take them. You might want to start Chess by correspondence. What is that exactly? Does that mean you write a letter to say, I moved yes. four bishops to yes. here, and then you wait yes. for the following week for the yes. Unfortunately, in those days, they did not have internet gaming. Right. So, so yes, there. yes. <laughs> and there's a way to do it. Actually, in, in chess tournaments, you have to obey a certain uh, regulation, and you have to write your moves, right? right? Both yours and your opponents. So it's that so kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Infinite. How are they end up in mathematical, mathematical operations? That's a very good question. So like in the queuing network example, I had an infinite matrix. How do we deal with that? That's very good. That was a trivial example because you could find the solution analytically, right? What we do is we try to truncate it so that we have a finite but a set of important states for the performance measure that we would like to compute. And in this kind of model, we use Lyapunov functions, actually, to bound, to bound the steady state probability that is within that set of interesting states. So I have only a certain group of levels that I have to consider in the solution process in that case. So this, this is the way to go. Otherwise, there's no uh, analytical solution for this kind of system where you have level dependencies. Thank you.